Thank you for the introduction. My name is Shannon McCauley and my company is Best Friends Training. As Sherry mentioned, I have been training for about 11 years and I'm a certified behavior specialist as opposed to just simply a obedience trainer. So I'm focusing more on the behavioral aspect of the dog. What psychologically makes them do what they do. Uh, anxiety, aggression, tray drive as opposed to are they just sitting and downing and recalling and things like that. So everybody should have a handout. What we're going to talk about today is dogs living safely with rabbits. And much of what we talk about is going to translate to rats, guinea pigs, cats, uh, chihuahuas, small dogs, anything that is tiny, squirrels, guinea pigs, any of those things, the train is very much the same and the urge for prey drive is very much the same. Okay? So even though we're talking about rabbits, keep that in mind. All right, this is my lovely assistant, Sadie. She is a purebred lab. She is actually about 10 years old. And this is Steele. He is a rescue dog. He is an Australian Shepherd mix, and he's actually 11. They've both been training with me for the duration of my whole business. So they are wonderful, wonderful little helpers. So we're going to be going over today what is pre-drive, how to get your dogs safely introduced to your rabbits, what to do if your rabbits, your dogs are not being safe with rabbits, how to request for what if my dog finds a cottontail in the backyard, what do I do, how do I handle that, and then we're also going to go over some training techniques that are important for beginning to have your dog coexist safely with your rabbit. So you can see they're doing what's called a place bed command. I don't care if they sit, lay down, wiggle, stand on the edge, just don't get off of the place bed. So you may have heard me a couple times when Steele had his front two feet off, correcting him and telling him to place bed because he needs to have all body parts on the place bed. But he's not required to be in a down or be in a sit, so it gives the dog complete freedom of movement versus expecting them to be in a sit or a down. Okay? Now, real quickly, by show of hands, I'm assuming you all have rabbits. How many of you guys have dogs? Okay. What breed? Uh, German Shepherd and Siberian. Okay. Mix, or you have two? Mix. Okay. Chihuahua. Very Collie and Tibetan Terrier. Okay. Same Yeah. Next dog? Uh, wiener Dogs and Doberman. Wiener and Doberman? I have five okay multi food and mixed breeds about how size what size uh, medium to large medium to large 65 to 90 okay okay you guys have dogs cocker spaniel yeah it's only the shepherd Ooh. okay yeah. nope no dogs okay so what we're going to do if you guys go ahead and take a look at your hand out there I've listed a lot of the breeds that I heard you mention. What we often don't realize is there are over 400 different breeds of dogs. The AKC, the American Kennel Club, generally classifies them into various groups. The gun dog group, the hound group, the toy group, the sporting group, etc. So I've separated them out into groups. Clearly I'm not illustrating all 400 dogs, but I've taken some of the most common breeds and I've written out here for you what these breeds were originally bred to do. Even if you have a mixed breed, what is absolutely imperative is to remember that that breed originates, that mixed breed originates from a purebred of something else. So what is an example of one of your mixes that you have? Um, great Pyrenees and Border Collie. Okay, so she needs to look at what are the tendencies of a Great Pyrenees and what are the tendencies of a Border Collie and how do those tendencies translate to how that dog is going to interact with my rabbit. And as you go through the different sporting groups, you're going to see some of the things that could be a heads up. Now, some of the breeds you've mentioned, I would definitely put in the heads up category, and we'll kind of talk about why. Now, that being said, just because a dog is a certain breed tendency, you don't want to just throw them in the bucket of they absolutely cannot interact with a rabbit, or just because they fall in a bucket of a breed that is not dangerous for rabbits, you can't just assume that they're not. Because not only do you have the breed tendencies, but then you have each individual dog, their characteristics, their history, their background, and their personal experiences. So again, this is not a, just because Shannon said labs are safe, <laughs> does it mean that labs are going to be safe with your dog, okay? This is just a general guideline to educate you about the breeds and where they come from. So prey drive is a term that we're going to talk about today. What prey drive is, is a dog's innate desire to go after what they perceive to be prey. We often forget that our dogs are not that far off from 
wolves. They certainly are still canines. And if you think about it, really only since the 1940s, 1950s, when suburbia was really kind of invented, dogs still had jobs and responsibilities and chores up until then. Now we look at them laying on our couch and we think that they're so cute, but we forget that probably 60 years ago, your bearded collie was responsible for keeping the coyotes away from the sheep. Or, you know, someone's fox terrier was responsible for keeping all of the foxes out of the chicken coop. So really, in the last 50, 60 years, yes, they live much more comfortable lifestyles, but what's also happened is we're taking away their jobs and their chores and their responsibilities. So you see aggression increasing. You see neurotic behaviors. You see aggressive behaviors. I've seen dogs sucking on doorknobs because they're just... If someone said to you, you know, you can't volunteer, you can't go to your job, you can't participate in, you know, family functions, you can't have hobbies, if you took all of those things away, you would really start to feel neurotic, anxious, like you're not contributing to society, etc. So dogs, they don't just curl up and feel depressed, they find jobs for themselves. So what that means is they may start guarding your back fence, they may start hunting for squirrels. They may start, you know, patrolling every time the kids get off the school bus. They will find a job, I guarantee it. It may not be a job that you would like them to have, though. So that's why it's very important to give dogs jobs and chores. It may not seem like they have a responsibility right now, but they do. They're thinking, they're concentrating, they know at whim, they can't just get up and go wander off and go look at your Slurpee. They know they need to stay here. So it's intellectually working them and challenging them, even though they look like two sluggos, which is kind of resting right now. Okay, so any questions on prey drive? The thing that's really important, if you guys have pens, I'm going to point out a couple things along the way. I've also not printed this out double side so that you could take notes on the back. Um, I don't know if I actually didn't think to bring pens. I don't know if we've got some pens or not. But the one thing I want you to not forget at all, do you see under the paragraph prey drive? Prey drive cannot be trained out of a dog. Your dog, you can train your dog to be obedient and to exercise self-control, but the instinct is always there and supervision is critical, okay? Would I put my dogs on a place bed, leave 15 rabbits running around this yard and go to the restroom? No, because they need their pack leader here. You asked the question. You said, if I walked in and I went, you know, would the dog come? And I said, if I was not giving him a counter command, probably. But if I stand here and give him a counter command, no matter how playful you are, no matter what you throw, no matter what you entice him with, if you walked over and put your Slurpee down in front of her face, if I'm giving her a counter command, I expect her not to break. But if I leave, <laughs> you know, the mice will play. She's probably going to slink off and come check out your Slurpee. Okay? Yes? Is there any significant difference in prey drive between male and female dogs? No, not typically. You typically don't see that. Um, it's very going to. It's going to be mostly aligned with the breed, and then it's going to be secondarily aligned with that dog's individual personality, temperament, and then lastly their personal experiences. They may have been allowed that if they were left to live on a ranch and hunt jackrabbits, well, they have a high prey drive because they had to hunt jackrabbits to survive and eat. So you adopt that dog now, bring it into your home. It's a lab. You check the box on getting a dog that's not high prey drive. But because of that dog's circumstances and lifestyle, it's going to be a danger if you're at, you're at it. Okay? Okay. So any questions on prey drive? Again, I cannot emphasize that enough. Prey drive cannot be trained out of a dog. It is instinctual. It is innate. To what degree it exists within your dog is going to be dependent on the breed, and it's going to be dependent on your individual dog. It can be managed through obedience, but it cannot be trained out and make it go away. Yes? Does it? Do puppies exhibit it? I mean, does it start immediately, or is there a certain age? Of it? it does. It starts immediately. You'll see dogs kind of, a lot of the behaviors that puppies are going through, they are testing the limits. They're learning how to hunt. You'll see them starting to pounce. You'll see them starting to, you know, use their jaw, pull on things. You'll see them sneak up on their siblings and all of a sudden jump on them. All of that looks like cute play, but it is all training for you know, future reproduction, it's training for hunting, it's training for pack hierarchy. They are training from the moment they're born. Okay, yes, you have a question? Yeah, is it heightened outdoors? Because my dog acts a lot different indoors than outdoors. Yes, my dogs, for example, can be in the house. There can be a rabbit running around my living room. I open the front door and there's a cottontail on the lawn. 
they will take off after a cottontail, even though their personal bunny is sitting right there. Now the key difference is, yes, there's an indoor-outdoor component. The other component is I release them from an obedience command. So for example, they're at the door, I've told them to wait, I open the door, they see that bunny, they're released, it's almost like coming out of a starting gate, there's going to be that arousal as they take off. The other thing that is the huge contributing factor is the reaction of the rabbit. So my bunny is just sitting there. These bunnies are just sitting there. But if all of a sudden you have a cottontail or a wild bunny or a fearful bunny take off running, that will elicit. Y'all didn't see when these bunnies first came in. Steel was very focused. He was watching, his ears were up, he was watching their movement. But I brought them over, I let him sniff, he sniffed them. They were fine, they're not reacting to him and he's completely ignoring them now. But if I had kind of kept them away from him or let them hop around and kept him in a place they command, he would have been real curious and starting to get aroused. And if you think about it, almost like going up a roller coaster, it's much harder to bring that dog down once they're up here than it is to cap the behavior much sooner. Okay? So yes, your dog can be fine with a personal bunny and then take off two seconds later after a cocktail. Okay? Okay, so let's go through the uh, different groups. First of all, you have the gun dog group. Now, in general, these dogs are bred to retrieve game bird, waterfowl, and small animals. Now, within that gun dog group, you have your pointers and setters, you have your spaniels, and you have your terriers. Pointers and setters typically locate the game for the hunter, and then the hunter gets them. So they are very sight-driven. They're constantly focusing on uh, the horizon, looking. They're very bad at eye contact because they're constantly surveying. When they actually spot it, they're going to point. They're going to be very still. They're not going to be dramatic and barking. Whereas your spaniels, they're designed to flush. So once they find something, they're going to roar, go in there barking and screaming so that everything takes off flying and running so that the hunter can then shoot them at that point. Then you have your terriers. Terriers are typically bred to go to ground. So they're going to go underground for badgers, things that live, which of course rabbits, can live underground in burrows. So looking at some of the big ones, you guys can read through this at your time, but looking at some of the big ones, Vichas are very common, golden retrievers and labs, any of your spaniels, spaniels are pretty dangerous in general. Spaniels are not a real good combination with prey drive because spaniels, again, are bred to flesh. They have that drive to see something and then to go after it, barking with all this fury to make the creature run. They are bred to make something run. So going after your rabbit, as you know, rabbits can be run to a point of exhaustion and heart attack and death. You don't want something running your rabbit, and then once something starts to run your rabbit, it's very hard to get that dog down off of the chase. Golden Retrievers and Labradors are a little bit different. They are bred to retrieve dead. So they don't have the same instinct for moving things, chasing things. So that's why I do think any of the dogs in the retriever family, again, as a general rule of thumb, are a very good combination with rabbits because they don't have high prey instincts, again, because they're bred to retrieve dead. The next thing is going to be your hound group. Hounds are also very dangerous. Sight hounds, scent hounds. So the sight hounds are designed to just simply, they're bred for speed and salmon. They are bred like your greyhound is a sight hound. They are bred to just run something down until they catch it. They've got phenomenal vision. Your scent hounds are going to sniff something down until they find it. Basset hounds, for example, those are going to be a centers. Beagles, they're bred mainly to hunt hare, which is rabbits. Your dachshunds, they are bred to hunt rabbits. Okay, that's why the long skinny bodies and the short legs, because they go underground and into tunnels. The next thing is going to be your greyhounds and your whippets. Whippets are just smaller versions of greyhounds. Greyhounds, again, are extremely dangerous. Greyhounds, you even have to be careful with small dogs. I've had clients, before they were clients, where greyhounds killed other small dogs in the household. So greyhounds with rabbits are a bad, bad, bad combination. Okay? The next thing is going to be your pastoral group. Steel is in that pastoral group. So pastoral is going to be any of your herding dogs. So the herding dogs are going to be your Australian Shepherds, your Bearded Collies, your Border Collies, Collies, German Shepherds, Sheepdogs, Welsh Corgis. All of those fall into the herding category. Whether they're herding sheep, cattle, goats, anything, they're herders. What that means as far as a breed characteristic is they're going to tend to come behind and want to shush 
things along. They're going to want to nip at ankles. They're going to, if you have multiple rabbits, you'll see them start to quarter. So if rabbits are all kind of running, you'll see a dog quarter to this side, quarter to this side, quarter, 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 till they kind of shush them in. So where it's important for a dog like a herding dog to make sure they're not nipping at the rabbit's flanks or tush or anything like that, or that they're just not running into a point of exhaustion because rabbits, you know, don't herd very well. They're not herding creatures. Cows, goats, they're bred to kind of cling to each other. Rabbits are bred to just kind of go and scatter in a million different directions. So you can imagine if you have this and then you have herding dogs going off after them, they can run into the point of exhaustion. So in general, I do like this particular group with dogs there or with rabbits there. They're a very good combination. I've had Aussies my whole life. I have two other Aussies at home. They are all excellent. These guys also live with pet rats. So the rats are about that big, and the rats run around on Steele's back, and they're very, very gentle with them. With the one exception is the German Shepherd. Even though people often forget, they think of them as protection dogs, but they originally are a herding dog. They're a part of the pastoral group. Now, German Shepherds, I've heard of some rabbits being killed by German Shepherds. They are so strong, so powerful. Their jaws are so big. There's very little room for mistake with German Shepherds. And German Shepherds have been kind of taken more out of that pastoral group and taken into protection work, search and rescue work, narcotic work, things like that, border patrol work, because they are so powerful and protective and they can be aggressive if trained to do so. So watch your German Shepherds. The next one is going to be the Terrier group. Anything that falls in the Terrier group is bad news. Terriers, as you know, just hunt rabbits. They go to ground. So Jack Russell Terriers, a lot of people don't know this. You know Jack Russell Terriers have that incessant just rawr, 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 and they have that really thick little tail. They're bred to go down into ground, stay down there potentially for hours until their hunter finds them. They're bred to breathe very shallowly and they're bred to have that incessant piercing rawr, 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 so their hunter can hear them down through the ground. And then they have that really thick tail so you can reach in, grab that tail and pull them out by the tail. So when you really do get to understand why dogs have been bred the way they are, it's really quite fascinating. You look at Rottweilers, Rottweilers used to, in Roman times, carry the coins from village to village. And no one's going to mess with a Rottweiler. So that's why they have tremendous guarding and protection tendencies. So again, Rottweilers are dating back to Roman times. Um, Rhodesian ribbats, they used to hunt lions. Dogs did not lay by the campfire with us. They had hardcore hunting jobs and they worked with man to hunt to for survival. Yes, you had a question? Uh, I just, mm -hmm. I read in a newspaper once where Jack Russell um, carriers were described as uh, thugs in clown suits. <laughs> <laughs> they are very OCD, they're very fixated. So like border collies, for example, border collies and rabbits could be a little iffy because they are going to get extremely focused. It's very hard to kind of get them to regroup. They just kind of go into a trance. And so the same thing is going to be true of Jack Russells. They tend to be the other OCD kind of a breed. So, okay, so we're going on to your toy group. I want to spend a couple minutes on the toy group. There's quite a few toy groups here listed. Your Cavalier King Charles, your Silky Terriers, Toy Terriers, Italian Greyhounds, Pinchers, Yorkies. The reason I mentioned several of them is what I want you to remember is those are all larger breeds that have been shrunk down. Even though they're toys, they have not. Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are bad news with rabbits because they are hardcore Spaniels. Even if you look at the miniature pinchers, those originated down from Dobermans. Those were originally from terriers. Italian Greyhound, that's just a little miniaturized big Greyhound. So that you still have that tremendous scent chasing things down to the point of exhaustion, to the point of killing. So don't underestimate the toy breeds. All they have done is been shrunk down into little packages. It doesn't mean that their characteristics and their tendencies have been taken away. Okay? Okay, last one is going to be your working group. Or I'm sorry, the utility group. That's one where they don't really fit into other groups. So here's some examples in the utility group. Your poodles, your schnauzers, your sharpays, pit bull terriers. And so poodle, what people don't realize is those are hunters. Those dogs are typically hunting dogs. Schnauzers came from terriers. A lot of people don't realize that. So your schnauzer is going to be not the best combination. The working group is going to be your Dobermans, Mastiffs, Great Danes, Rottweilers. 
um, Siberian Huskies even. People think of a Siberian Husky now as a sled dog. But what a lot of people don't know is they're originally bred to herd the reindeer. So they were originally a herding dog and now they're a sled dog. So just because our needs have changed, we don't need herding of reindeer anymore, we've turned them into sled dogs. So just because the needs have changed, it's also again very valuable to know what your breed was originally bred to do for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and realize we've only really started to change it in the last 50, 60 years. Okay? Any questions about the breeds? Any questions about your own dogs? Now that you've mentioned what you have, and now that you've learned a little bit more about your breeds, any characteristics that you guys see that are familiar? Yes? In particular, great dangers. How, do they, how well do they react to I haven't had a lot of Great Danes come to think of it with little ones, but Great Danes, they are so large. The biggest thing I would worry about with Great Danes is they're gangly and stepping on the rabbit. They don't always have as much control of their body. I could see them slipping. I have had a lot of Great Danes that live with very small dogs, and they've done very well with that, but I can't honestly think that I've had any Great Danes with um, rabbits, but I would also not associate Great Danes as having high prey drops. They're usually not the ones out there chasing the squirrels and hunting down the, the little birds and things like that. If your dog's ever killed a possum, a squirrel, a bird, something like that, odds are pretty good that is not a good fit for your rabbit, okay, if they've ever tasted blood like that. Mm -hmm. You said that, you know, like great things for big dogs. There was another article recently in a newspaper that said that more children were injured by um, um, the St. Bernard's than any other breed, and it was just because they were so big that they accidentally hurt the, the children. I mean, it's not like pit bulls or something that you might expect. It's just a big, big dog. Yeah, I don't know if the number one bite with the most, the dog with the biggest number of bites is. Like, I don't know. What else, who else thinks? Lab. What's number two? Twelve. Now, labs, not because they're vicious, there's so many of them. So by sheer number, that's why, and that's why people are really careful when they look at the list and people say, oh, pit bulls are number 10. Well, pit bulls are number 10 because there's not as many of them. Labs are number one just because of sheer volume, okay? So you have to really take that in consideration, which what are the most common breeds out there? Okay, yes? Maltesers would fall into the toy group, and Maltesers are not too far from like the Cotons and the Bichons. What's actually kind of cool about those, they were originally bred by pirates to be ratters on pirate ships. So you see these little fluffy white things now, and they're all prim and proper. They used to be ratters on pirate ships. Yeah. But, you know, so with a rabbit, I wouldn't be quite as concerned. Now, Maltesers, though, in general, do not always have the best reputation as far as even Maltesers with children. If I were to line up a Bichon and a Maltese, Maltesers are not always the best with that. They're not always as predictable. They could be a little bit more reactive with kids. So if a breed typically is having issues with kids, you can probably assume that they're going to be having issues with dogs. And the other thing I run into too is people don't often have a lot of obedience. Still, place. Place. Good boy. Um, people often don't have a lot of obedience on their small dogs. People joke that as trainers, our worst bites are going to come from little dogs. Because if you have a little Maltese who's growling at you, and it's like, oh, how cute. Are they going to take a bone away? And they're like, oh, isn't that precious? He's guarding it. You get a 120-pound Rottweiler doing that to you. You get a German Shepherd who's jumping on you like a Maltese might be doing. And people are dealing with it immediately with a behavior specialist. Problem with little dogs is people steal. My place. He's fine. He's all right. Place. Um, the thing is with little dogs, is people often excuse a lot. They don't have higher demands of them, higher requests. But they need to remember that their brain, your Chihuahua's brain, is not any different than Sadie's brain and her need to work, her desire to have a job, her desire to fill the pack, etc. They're just in a smaller package. Mm -hmm. um, West Island bike fairs. I understand are incredibly, I've, I've seen that they're incredibly good with kids. Mm -hmm. They're very relaxed, but they're still terriers. Yeah. I mean, does that, does that kind of transfer over to rabbits, or is it just... Just because they're good with kids does not make... You could have dogs that are excellent with kids, but they still have a very high prey drive for prey animals. 
But on the flip side, if you have a dog that's not good with children, you can more often than not assume that they're going to be a little iffy with the animals. And the main reason is, Seal, if they're not respecting your cub, meaning your two-legged cub, they sure as heck are not going to be respecting your rabbits, you know, your, your leadership and everything else. So that's where you're going to be running into problems with the little ones too. So again, obedience is really, really important. <laughs> Somebody else's children embarrass place. Well, and what I tell folks is, my dogs are not show dogs. They do not go to trials. I've never had a desire for that. My dogs have never once competed in the trial. It just doesn't interest me. I'm more interested in dogs in the home, rescue dogs, being able to be successful in the home. So what I tell folks is, you're going to see my dogs making mistakes. You know, they are just like kids. I don't expect them to be perfect soldiers, and they will make mistakes. But what is important is that you as handlers know how to fix it, anticipate it, deal with it, etc. Okay, you'll notice I have not let him off the hook. I also have not scolded him. I haven't been forceful with him. I haven't been physical with him. But I have not let him off the hook. Even if it meant me crossing the room and escorting him over there, he still knows that it's not okay and he can't keep getting off. Okay? Okay, any other questions before we move on to the next topic? Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about here is understanding the predatory behaviors in dogs and how rabbits react. We touched on this briefly with if a rabbit is going to stay still and be calm, you're not going to see a rat dog bolt off. If a rabbit bolts, when that cottontail bolts, my dogs will chase that cottontail. So rabbits are prey animals, and their instincts are to flee. That's why their eyes are on opposite sides. So when you're looking at, is an animal a prey animal? The closer that the eyes are to the front, the less prey they typically are. The more the eyes circle around here, the more likely they are a prey type animal because they have to have that peripheral vision. So if you're ever wondering what falls into a prey category, where the eyes are positioned is a very good indicator. So the next thing is, rabbits, as we talked about earlier, can die of heart attacks. They can be run, 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 curl up under there, and just keel over after the chase is done. It's that rush of adrenaline, it's that panic, and that heart attack. So you really don't ever want your dog chasing. Some dogs will catch and chase a rabbit, or catch a rabbit and shake them violently. They'll snap their back. So they are going to simply just grab them, and then you've seen dogs do that, that thrashing back and forth until the rabbit is just snapped. And in most cases, too, if you think about how dogs are going to kind of pounce on another dog, they're going to come back here and grab onto the back of the neck. Well, a rabbit neck can clearly not even begin to handle that. You also could have them just step on their back and break their back. Um, the next thing is hunting behaviors. Dogs are silent hunters. So when you have dogs that take off running like the spaniels and they're going, rah, 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 they are flushing to make the things fly and run so that the hunters can shoot them. Even if the hunters aren't present, that's what they're bred to do. But when dogs are truly hunting, they are very silent, very still, and very predatory. So you'll see, like when Steel first met the rabbit, he was very still, he's just kind of watching. Now if you saw Sadie kind of walking up on a rabbit, you would see her start to come in real slow, and she would be approaching slow, then you would start to see her lower her body down as she got closer down to the ground. Okay, and then all of a sudden, at some point, you would see her just go whoosh, and she would go into the full sprint. So when dogs are very still, that is a more cautionary behavior. The next thing is when dogs' mouths are open and relaxed and panting, as a general rule of thumb too, my dogs are so, see, come, come, good girl, sit, sit. Good girl. Sit. Uh -huh. Sit. So typically, you'll see when a dog is relaxed, their mouth is going to open like that. Okay. Now, if Tammy were to walk up and pet her, my guess is she would probably close her mouth. Now, she, back, sit. Come on up and just go to pet her. Watch Sadie's mouth as someone extends her hand to pet her. Okay. The mouth is going to close. Okay. You're good. And then watch when she steps away as soon as the mouth opens back up again into a relaxed state. So when mouths are open, like even when children go to pet dogs, the biggest misunderstood body part is the tail. Can't tell you how many times I hear, well, the tail was wagging, Sadie, place. And the dog, no, <laughs> place. Sadie, no, place. 
legs. Um, so, good girl. Oh, about the jaw. So the most common thing is a wagging tail. I can't tell you how many times I hear that. The dog's tail is wagging just before they bit the child. Wagging tails, and we can definitely, if you have more tail questions, dog is relaxed and kind of panting, and they're calm, and someone's about to pet them. You'll see them close their mouth for a split second, but if they're still like, as the kid's petting, and then you see the dog kind of go, you know that dog has now relaxed. They've loosened the jaw muscles. So the same thing is going to be true with... Her, it watches I bring a rabbit towards her. Mouth is open and relaxed. So as she starts to get aroused and look at what it is, the mouth is closing. And then the mouth will open back up into a relaxed state. Okay? So the mouth is your best indicator, the tightness of the jaw muscles, as to how that dog is feeling. Okay? Okay. All right. Questions on understanding predatory behaviors in dogs. Any questions about that? Okay. Moving on to the next thing. It's very important to communicate that your rabbits are members of your family. If you have good, clear leadership within your home, there should not be a lot of debate between your dogs as to who your pack members are. So if I have rabbits running around and I tell my dogs, leave it, those are my cubs and my pack members just as the dogs are. So if you have weak leadership within your household, your dog is going to say, Psh, and they're going to do as they darn well please with that rabbit, and they're going to blow you off. So obedience is very, very important. There's also kind of an old school method where the idea used to be if dogs were difficult with cats, you put cat urine in a squirt bottle and you squirt the dog with cat urine. Well, my thought is, you know, he's only going to really hate that cat that much more. <laughs> so I really kind of go with the philosophy of you want to make things excellent when that rabbit is around. So instead of punishing the dog or consequencing the dog, you want to make it excellent things happen to me when that little furball is around. Okay? So that's the overall philosophy. I do not use electronic collars with dogs. So, for example, let's say you have a dog that every time it approaches the rabbit, you are zapping it with an electronic collar. All you're doing is making a very simple, classic conditioning association between rabbit equals pain. Period. And so, when you are not present and you are not supervising, I mean, is this going to work for you when you're supervising and you have this in your hand and you have it on the dog's neck? Sure. But the second you walk away, that dog is going to know, and they are going to be after that rabbit in a heartbeat. So do not use negative associations with the rabbits. So here's a few things that I do do. Every time that you're feeding and watering, my dogs are in the room with me when I feed and water the rabbits. If I'm kind of shutting the door and sneaking in there, and they're not allowed in there, it's kind of like this forbidden Disneyland of what's in there, what's in there, i got to get in there, what's in there. But if you let them participate in it, the feeding process, etc. Now that being said, when my dogs are in there, they're in an obedience command. Maybe they're in a sit, or they're in a down, or if they're permitted to freely walk, if they get too close to a rabbit cage and they're poking their nose in, I say back, and they have to back up. But again, that's why you want to have strong obedience on them so that they can participate with the rabbits. But again, don't make it a forbidden place that they're never allowed to be in. Now that being said, you want to make sure not only is the dog being obedient, but they're giving you the right attitude. Let's say she's sitting on her place bed while I'm feeding the rabbits, and she's like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, she's sitting. She's on her place bed. But her attitude is not at all what you need it to be. So a lot of people think, oh, yeah, my dog's sitting. Check the box. Uh-uh. That dog is not mentally and emotionally focused on you, and they're not truly learning the behavior because they're giving you the wrong attitude and the wrong mental state. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So, going back to uh, having your dog rabbit with you. Another thing I like to do is groom them. So, if grooming, feeding, those are all pack behaviors. Those are all things that dogs very much value as a pack. So, if I'm going to be sitting down and I'm going to be just kind of grooming the rabbit, letting him look, letting him sniff, grooming him a little bit, grooming the rabbit. Now again, if he were standing up, if he were circling like a shark, if he was aroused, 
that's not the time to be doing this because the dog is not mentally submissive to you, okay? So right now he is in a calm state. I'm letting him just sniff the rabbit a little bit. What you're looking for, you don't ever want them like jabbing with their snout or kind of really punching into the rabbit. You need to stop that behavior with either a back or a leave it command. Leave it means don't touch it, it's not in your mouth. Out means it's in your mouth, spit it out, <laughs> okay? Back means back up. So again, if you wanna do some specific training around this, there are very specific words. My dogs have about 18 words. Sit, down, leave it, place, out, come, back, uh, uh, place, free. So they've got about hush, off. There's about 20 words that tell them exactly what they should and should not be doing. So there's no ambiguity. So the next thing I'm looking for is they should never be doing this. Okay, you don't want your dog kind of coming in with their front teeth and like nibbling on the rabbit. So again, it's going to be a leave it. Now right now it might look like he's this is actually respect. He's just kind of averting his eyes. He looks at it. He's not avoiding it. He's actually being just very respectful of the fact that it's in my lap right now. So as I bring it around, I let him kind of look and sniff. Good boy. And I'm praising positive behaviors. So as he's in a calm state, it's already good boy, steal. Good boy, easy. Now you might have an easy command, which in our world means gentle. Okay, so if he's starting to get a little bit excitable with the rabbit, Easy, good boy, easy, good boy, good job. So nothing but positive praise, affection, excellent things are happening to him because he's in a very good attitude, a very good mindset with that rabbit, okay? So then you're just sitting there, you're grooming your dog, you're grooming your rabbit. Um, what I've even done before too, you gotta be real careful introducing food. Steel's not too crazy about food, but if I smeared some peanut butter on my leg while I was grooming the rabbit, Again, this is excellent. I get to lay here and lick peanut butter while this little fuzzball is around. That's a good, excellent, positive association. Now, Sadie, if I were to introduce food, she would be a bad combination because Sadie gets so food driven that she starts to run through like, do you want me to sit? Do you want to high five? Do you want me to bang? Do you want me to roll over? Do you want me to lay down? She starts getting very wiggly with her body, which can become dangerous for the rabbit, and she gets too aroused. So mentally and emotionally, I don't want her in that aroused state around a rabbit. So that's an example of where I would be comfortable introducing food as a praise for him. I would not be comfortable introducing food as a praise for her because it changes her mental state too much. Okay? Does that make sense? So again, you have to know your dog. Down. So you can see she's already a little bit more excited. Down. 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 Good girl. Down. Now you notice I'm not like down. Down. I'm not harsh. I'm not down. Okay? You don't want to add unnecessary aggressive energy to the situation, but it's calm and it's assertive. Down. Good girl. Down. Even my good girls are not down. Oh, good girl, Sadie! Because if you see if I change my voice, I can immediately get her all excited, huh? You can change it in a heartbeat with your energy. Down. So now I need to shut her energy back down again. Down. Down. Good girl. Down. Easy. See, she's getting a little bit footy now. Good girl. Off. So her command is off, which is not putting her feet up on things. Good girl. Good girl. Sadie, free, 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 free. Good girl. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is equipment. Did you notice that even when I released her, she is under my control at all times. When he comes around, let's go just catch him when he makes his way through. Um, place. So when you're doing any kind of work with your rabbit, the most important thing for you to do is have secure equipment on your dog. Let me make sure that I haven't forgotten anything here with the grooming. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so we're allowing gentle investigation of the rabbit with the rabbit safe in your arms. Grooming your rabbit makes the rabbit feel comfortable, dog feel comfortable. Good things always happen to your dog when the rabbit is around. Remember, we don't have feelings of jealousy, resentment, etc. 
um, extra affection treats, but we did address that you want to be discriminatory as to whether or not your dog can handle the introduction of food around rabbits. The next thing is verbal praise when the dog is being gentle. So you saw me doing that with Steel. Um, the next thing is if your dog's being inappropriate with the rabbit. First of all, you have to catch your dog in the act. Dogs make an association between cause and effect in 1.5 seconds. So if your dog, you've left the room, you come back and you find some bunny fuzz on the floor and your dog's nowhere to be seen, you cannot drag your dog back over there, rub his nose in the bunny fur and scold him. You've lost the timing of the moment. Now, if at that moment I see Steel, you know, go to like pull out some bunny fuzz right there in that moment, uh -uh, leave it. You've caught it in that moment and you've addressed it. We already talked about being firm and clear and concise with your words. We talked about not using version techniques with the remote control collar. And then the other thing is, when you do this, you always have to have your dog secured. Now, when I refer to equipment, I jokingly I call it scuba tanks. If you were to go scuba diving and I gave you a crack mask and a half-filled oxygen tank and one flipper, you're either going to drown or you're going to have a really bad time. So the same thing is true of dog training. If you do not have proper equipment on your dog, secured safely, you run the risk of hurting your dog. You run the risk of your rabbit being seriously injured. There is not a lot of room for one mistake with a dog, okay? Dogs have 750 pounds per square inch of bite compression. Humans have 200, okay? So it gives you an idea, and this is not even one of your more powerful breeds. And it's been a long time since I've done this to her, but even her size, she's only 60 pounds, but she could on my skull in a heartbeat, even with her size. So you take a German Shepherd, that's a whole other ballgame, okay? Okay, so going back to equipment. If you're using, a, thank you, <laughs> if you're using a leash, you're gonna be my guinea pig, Darren as you're disappearing on me. I don't ever use fabric leashes for this reason. If he pulls on this, and he's gonna hold my weight, so he's not gonna let go. As he's holding my weight, it is going to slip and eventually cut and burn your hand. Go ahead and stand up. Don't let go. Lean opposing me. He and I can carry both of our weight without this leather leash slipping through either of our hands, okay, because it's leather. So that's a simple example between if you have a leash and at that moment your dog lunges for your rabbit, in essence this is a faulty scuba tank because you cannot maintain control of that leash at the moment that you need to grip it and hold it tight. Likewise, people will do this and if you hold tight and I hold tight, you actually can completely crush your hands. You can break the bones in your hand. So I'm not a big fan of wrapping. You're better off just having a good, sturdy, healthy grip with a leather leash. Okay? The so next I, thing is... What hand through the loop? What was that? What about hand through, hand through the loop on the end there? Yes, yeah, so you definitely can do that, but that's simply a backup. You know, oh. you're still holding it here. Oh, okay. And it's the idea that this, you lose control, but you still mm -hmm. can lose control of that. Okay. okay? But this is really just a backup. Okay? Um, the next type of thing is a flexi lead. Do not ever, ever, ever use these or rely on these. If you see a dog coming anywhere near your dog on this, bad news. If you see a dog coming anywhere near a rabbit on this, bad news. The only thing that's holding this together is a plastic mechanism inside. I have seen these snap in a heartbeat. The other problem is this is just thin. Hear that plastic? That's the only thing holding this together. I'm not even putting nearly the pressure I was putting on this collar earlier. The second thing is I have a client, beautiful little girl, she's about 12 years old, and she has got her thighs slit from here to here with a permanent scar across the back of her legs. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen this do this. And it cuts the person's leg. All of a sudden they lose control. They're in pain. They drop the leash. Then the dog takes off running. And this is scaring them as it bounces along behind and the dog runs into traffic. Flexi leads are one of the worst things you could possibly use ever. Okay? So if you have your dog working, you can use a long line, which is a big 30 foot, I forgot to bring it, but it's a big 30 foot leash. So it's a fabric leash, cotton leash, 30 feet, you can use those. Leather leashes, but always make sure your leashes are secure. The next thing is collars. This is what's called a flat collar. This is a standard collar that most dogs are going to wear. Whether it's a buckle or a clip, Steel's wearing a leather one. 
but you don't want to ever hook a leash to this collar and rely on it for security. The reason being, dogs can slip out of it any heartbeat. No matter how tight you put it, they can still slip out because there are some dogs, they don't have a lot of difference between the thickness of their neck and their muscle tone and their actual skull. The other problem with this is you can really hurt your dog. At the moment they lunge after the rabbit, that is a quick snap to their windpipe, which is extremely dangerous for your dog. A good option is what's called a martingale. This is the modern hybrid between the old metal choke chains that used to compress and this. So this collar, if the dog tries to slip out, it gently compresses, pre preventing slippage. It also is going to distribute the weight evenly. So if they suddenly lunge after that rabbit, it's not on the windpipe, okay? It's gonna safely distribute around their neck. So Sadie's actually wearing one right now. I also make what I call tails. So these are something I make for my clients. They're called tab leads, but I just make them with clothesline because dogs will chew them. And you have little stopping points, you have little handles, but the idea is you have something on your dog at all times. You never saw me have to reach down and grab Sadie by the throat or the neck or escort her over because I had a little handle. Free. Out. Free. But the idea is it allows you to stay in an upright, controlled position, not at your weakest position right here where your back is bent. Your dog is at their greatest strength in their chest and their shoulders. You are at your weakest when you're bent like this. When you can stay upright with proper equipment, whether it be a leash or a tail or something like that, you have much more control over the dog, and also you have more leadership. When you lower your body, you lose authority versus staying upright and in a controlled, confident position with your dog. Okay? Free. Place. Good girl. Okay, so any questions on equipment? Okay, the next thing is a basket muzzle. There are two different types of muzzles on the market. Mm -hmm. Actually, different yes. equipment. Some people have the like, full harnesses. harnesses, good, bad, and different. Harnesses tend to arouse prey drive. There's different kinds of harnesses. I should have brought them in. I have them in my cart. There are harnesses that hook on the spine. The problem with those is they create a push-pull resistance. So as your dog pulls into the harness, let's see that here, you get this game of push and pull. As you push in, the dog pulls back. It's almost like holding a guy back in a bar fight. So the dog's leaning in, you're pulling back, they're pulling in even harder. If you look at dogs that work on harnesses, search and rescue dogs, police dogs, narcotic dogs, right before you send a police dog into a drug house, you have them on a harness. You are pulling them back so that they're on two legs and they actually have these rubber sticks that they hit them with like ha, 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 ha. They're arousing them. They're holding them back and arousing them, holding them back and then they release them. The dog goes in with all that attitude and drive and energy. You want a dog to go into a dangerous situation with that. You don't want that in a family pet. If you do have to have a harness because you've had neck damage, spine damage, or you're a breed like a dachshund who maybe should not be getting pulled back on your neck, there's what's called an easy walk harness where the leash hooks to the breastbone. So instead of pulling from the spine, it guides them to the left or the right and it takes that push-pull bar fight sensation away which changes the attitude and the demeanor of the dog. Okay? Okay, muzzles. There are two different types of muzzles. There are the muzzles that completely bind your mouth. There are also what's called basket muzzles. I do not use the muzzles that bind the mouth. If you've ever been had a groomer or something like that, they're extremely dangerous. Dogs can overheat in about 15 minutes, even in a cool room like this. You may not notice that my guys have been panting at various times, even in a cool air-conditioned room. When their mouths are bound, they're like, and they will overheat in a heartbeat. It also causes them mental and emotional distress. Remember I said I'm a behavior specialist. So I'm not just looking at, is the dog doing the obedience command? How is it affecting them mentally and emotionally? If I put you into a back alley at 2 o'clock in the morning and I bound your hands, you are going to be more emotionally reactive, more distressed, because you know you're bound. Dogs' mouths are their hands. So this basket muzzle allows a dog to fully move. They can bark, pant, snap. They could lunge at that rabbit if they wanted to. They could snap at the rabbit, but there's just a little cage around it, if you will, that's going to protect them. They make these in metal. They also make these in vinyl. I personally use the vinyl 
If you've ever been hit by a metal one, it hurts. Okay, so obviously that would do great damage to your rabbit. So the vinyl one is still going to hurt. I mean, it's still a solid cage, but not nearly as badly as the metal one will. So the way this would fit, and personally, anytime you're doing work, first of all, I need to give you guys the caveat that if you're looking to go home and try with your dogs and your rabbits, I really recommend you do it with a professional because really, and a professional like myself or someone who specializes in prey drive, because one mistake if Steele and Sadie are introducing each other and they get into a fight, okay, we have a bloody ear, we have a bloody foot, we have a cut in the back of the neck, that's the worst that it's gonna be. You're, that same thing happens to your rabbit and the rabbit's dead. There's just not the same margin of error if you make a mistake, right? So this is a basket muzzle. So you can see that he can even drink through it, he could pant, he could open his mouth, he could do everything that he needs to do. It's just going to secure him from actually making contact with a rabbit. So when my boy Colby was first meeting my rabbits, I had adopted him, and he spent the evenings on the basket muzzle. I knew I could leave it on him for an hour, two hours, three hours. He wasn't going to overheat. It wasn't going to be a problem. But I could, with reasonable assurance, know that even if I turned my back for a second, or because you have to go from total supervision to generally existing within the house. There's got to be something in the middle, so you need to have some type of protection or barrier to ensure your rabbit safety. Okay? Questions about equipment? Okay, remember scuba tanks. Don't ever, ever, ever try dog training, just like you would not go scuba diving without properly fitted tanks and flippers and masks. You don't ever want to dog train with faulty equipment, poorly designed equipment, okay, or equipment that slides off or is going to snap. Okay? We have been going for about an hour. If y'all would like to take a little break, then we're going to get into like the training portion of things. I know this was the sit still and listening portion. <laughs> we'll get into the training portion. If y'all want to take, what do you think, about five, ten minutes? We no, five minutes. Okay. We'll go ahead and take a five-minute break. And I want to buy raffle tickets. Sadie, place. Okay, you guys ready? No. Place. <laughs> Okay. So, one thing that's really important, you notice I have them change lights. Just little things. I, I don't like to get my pat dogs patterned. I like to change things up because it's a matter of whatever I ask you to do, I need you to do it. Easy. Easy. Good boy. Easy. Notice how I'm not chit-chatting, I'm not bearing the commands, you know, steal, I told you not to do that, steal, leave those bunnies alone, Sadie. You are not shriveling up. Place. Place. Um, you don't ever want to bury commands, especially at that moment that you need it. You don't want, you, it's like Charlie Brown. It's very clear and concise. Okay? Okay, so, obviously steal is interacting with the rabbits a little bit more. So he is supervised, I am watching him. He's got some equipment on him, he's got collars on him, but I also know him very well. I know how he's gonna handle himself with rabbits. He's been out here for a while with the rabbits, leave it. Leave it. <laughs> and the jelly beans, leave it. Good boy. Now, in general, you get two tries. By the third, you get a consequence. His consequence is a little mouth jab. You know, I don't smack my dogs, I don't hit them on the tush or hit them on the nose. That's human consequences, spanking or slapping. He gets a snout to the shoulder. So this is another dog consequencing him just like a dog would. Or I might give him a little scruff shake or I might give him a little pinch on the ear. Dogs understand communication right in through here best. This is a human consequence, and it's just really to release your own anger and your own frustration. It's not particularly effective for the dog's communication. So I asked him twice, instead of me going, leave it, leave it, leave it, because then it's, you're just, it's, it's useless screaming, and then you condition your dog to very high levels of communication. Leave it, leave it, leave it, okay? So we will do this by the third time. Whether I have to escort you away, you know, as I told Sadie to leave it twice, by the third, I escorted her back over there. So, you don't, dogs naturally try things in sets of threes. When I run into dogs that do things six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, on occasion, it's because that dog is just born more persistent. 
more often than not, it's because the family is inconsistent. They let the dog get away with something on the sixth time, then the fourth time, then the eighth time, then the fifth time, and they're not consistent. So innately, your dogs are born to test things in sets of threes. If your dog is beyond that, you have to ask yourself, what have you done to create that? Okay? Okay. So let's go back to our packet here. I'm make sure I've not missed anything. Go take a look at um, if your dog, introducing your dog and your rabbit. We talked about having a secure collar on and a leash. We talked about the basket muzzle. We talked about having a long line, meaning you could back tie your rabbit. So if I had two people introducing the rabbit, I would have one handler. I would have one handler with the dog, and then I would have one person with the rabbit. You gotta be real careful if it's just you because you're down on the ground with the rabbit. Dog is over top of you with more strength and imposing power. So if it is just you, I would have him back tied to a pillar in the house or something with a 30 foot long line. So if I'm here with the rabbit, he is back tied so that he can make it to us. But if the rabbit takes off running, he's going to get all of about one or two steps before the back tie is going to catch him. Then I don't have to be panicky. Did I grab him in time, let the rabbit take off, etc. Which leads to the next thing is if the rabbit wants to bolt and the rabbit is uncomfortable, let the rabbit go. Don't worry, a lot of people will tend when the rabbit starts to wiggle, they try to hold on to the rabbit because they're afraid the rabbit's going to get loose and take off running and the dog is going to get the rabbit. You're probably going to have a hard time holding on to that rabbit. Just let it go and focus on hanging on to the dog. So you want the rabbit to feel that it can get away. It does what it does best. It runs, it hops, it's got speed, dexterity, angling that we can only hope for. Let it go and just worry about the dog. Don't try to hang on to the rabbit. Okay. The next thing is if you have multiple dogs, you need to be very careful with multiple dogs because prey drive will be aroused. If Steel were here and he's kind of looking at the rabbits and all of a sudden Colby, another male, comes in and Colby's like, what do you got, what do you got? You will see Steele's behavior be very different in the presence of Colby versus in presence of Sadie, who's another female, because my two males can tend to be a little bit more competitive with each other. And so you have to know the dynamics of your dog and of your pack, but I would personally not, you'll notice I did not just have a rabbit with both dogs. Each dog met them separately, Sadie steals in there, now if I invited Sadie in there, I would also put them into down commands so that they're very controlled because it is very easy for them to feed off of each other in an instant, okay? Okay, all right, so a couple things we talked about the commands. I use out for spit it out. I use leave it for don't touch it, meaning it's not yet in your mouth. I use back for back up. I use off for put all four feet on the ground, like if they're putting one foot on the rabbit's back or something like that. So those are the key commands that I'll use in those actions. I also have a strong down on my dogs and I have a strong place bed command. We've already talked about the place bed command. Free. Place. He has complete freedom to do whatever he wants on that place bed. He just needs to stay on it. Steal. Come. No. Come. Place. Good boy. Again, did you hear the very clear? Come. And I also wasn't giving time to respond. He was actually, you guys may have thought that he was actually ignoring me right about here. You heard me say no because he was about to go that way to say hi to you guys. So I said no right here, but I also didn't correct him or consequence him because I know he was walking around that. He was not being defiant. He was actually trying to go around that. So you have to be careful that you don't jump the gun and think that your dog would be naughty or being defiant, okay? Okay, so with a down command, how many of you guys have a down command on your dog? Okay, so a down command Place. Good boy. Place. No. Place. She's the food girl. She's my food girl. Yes, as you can see. Okay, so when I'm teaching her down, Sadie, come. Steal. <laughs> come. Let's see if they can. Okay. So, when I'm teaching a down, freak, sit. 
you always start with them in a sit. Now the way a lot of people teach downs is they go at an angle like this. What that does for most dogs who don't know a down, she will do it because she's trained to know what that means. But most dogs, if you go angrily like this, their butt pops up and they follow the snack. What I teach folks is, first of all, you want to have the snack pointed up with a decent sized piece so that it's worthwhile for them. You want to have your fingernails touching fuzzy lips at all times. If you get too far away from the fuzzy lips, you can lose your dog's interest and focus. <laughs> Sit. Now the next thing I do is just doing her high five. See what I mean? She gets so focused. She's going to run through her high five, her barks, her speaks, her bangs. Off. So fuzzy lips and watch what her back does. Off. As I go straight down like water on a waterfall, do you see her back arch? And then I can bring the water down the stream. So what I tell folks to just remind them not to do that angular thing is just which way does waterfall. Water goes straight down and then it goes down the stream. Because the important part is you need the back hips to kick. When a dog is in a sit, Sadie place. When a dog is in a sit, they're sitting like this. When you bring the snack down between their paws and they follow it, they kick back on their hips like this which then allows you to slide them into a down position. But when they stay like this, it's very easy for them to just simply pop up. So that's why arcing the back is so important because it shifts the weight back onto the tush and it takes it off of the knees. Okay? Free. Free. Sit. So again, watch your back now that you know what you're looking for. Come. Sit. Straight down between the paws. See yeah, how she's sitting on the meat of her cheeks? And then I slide it down the waterfall, or the stream rather, and she gets her snack. Then the next thing is you have to teach them how to maintain their down. If I suddenly come up, most dogs will automatically mirror you and pop right back up. So what I do is I get them in their down, and then you stay bent. Down, good job, down, and you reinforce. Down, good girl, down. Good girl. Then you're going to come partially up, down, and under. You don't bring the snack over the head because if you bring it over, they will pop up to greet you. So you come down and under the face. The other thing that I'm doing is I don't have my snacks in front of me as I'm standing up because they're going to follow that scent. So if you notice, free. if I start again, Come. Sit. Waterfall. Stream. Then I stay bent and under. Bent and under. And I keep the snacks to my chest so that I'm not tempted to be bringing them down and under. Then as I stand, the snacks are staying to my chest. Pinch off a piece and under. Pinch off a piece and under. Because most people tend to have it right here at nose height, and the dog is going to simply follow that. If I stand here long enough, <laughs> she's going to key up <laughs> down and try to snag some. They don't usually get these little jerky things, so she's awfully excited about these jerky things. Then the next thing to work on is them maintaining it. Now, something I have on all my dogs is what's called a release command. So what I'd ask folks is, well, you've got your dog in a down, but how do they know when they can get up? So we have... Down. I have the word free. Free means you're done. You're off the hook. Whatever I've asked you to do, whether you've asked to sit, down, place, whatever, free means you're off the hook. You can get up. So you absolutely want to have a release command on your dog. I don't like okay and I don't like let's go. Because you're sitting there at the front door, pizza guy comes, dog's in a sit stay. Uh huh, how much to owe you? 10 bucks? Okay. And the dog's right out the door. So okay and let's go are two part of your everyday language. So about 90% of my clients use the word free. I have some that use vomitos. I have some that use 10-8 because that means back in service for police officers. I don't care what you use, just not okay and let's go. Okay? Free. Good girl. Sit. Down. Now eventually you want to get your dog to the point where they don't need all of the hand signals. I can technically free. Sit. When a dog is very strong, she hasn't done this in a while, let's see if she can do it. Come. Sit. 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 Down. Down. 
Good girl. When they can do it with your back, you know they're not relying on a head bob or eyeballs <laughs> or something like that. So a lot of times they go down, you know, or they go down, like put your hands behind your back, no head bobs, and say down. Because you want verbal comprehension on your dog. You need to be able to be across the room and give them commands, not them rely on you crossing the room, standing in front of them, and giving them the hand signal. Okay? Down. Free. Place. So the next thing is the place bed command. So you can use place, bed, spot, cushion. You'll notice that we use a trampoline. My guys, I could actually put like a bed sheet on the ground and tell my guys to place, and they will maintain that position. As long as there is a color difference, or a texture difference. If we have Berber carpet on Berber carpet, they're not gonna be able to do that. But if we had dark brown Berber on like white Berber, they could comprehend that because of the color change. So with a place command, I use these elevated trampolines because it gives them a very clear understanding of what's on and what's off. Because it's very easy for them to be like this and not all the body parts are on the place bed or you saw steel with his front legs off. So what I tell folks is a general thumb, pretend the ground is scalding hot lava. They need to have all body parts on the place bed at all times. And I don't care, place, 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 place. Good girl. Like I said, I don't care what she does on it. She can stand, lay down, wiggle, roll on her back. I don't care, just don't get off of it. Now what I just did is an example of what's called proofing, place. Now what proofing is, there are three stages of dog training. The first is showing, when you show a dog a brand new exercise. The second is reinforcing, daily, nightly, weekly homework. You have to reinforce for a couple weeks. The last stage is what's called, uh, uh, place. The last stage is what's called proofing. Examples of proofing are, you can go and tap your place, place, Place. Okay. You can even be playful with her. Place. Place. Encourage her. Place. Place. Good girl. Place. Leave it out. Good girl. So that was a really, I said leave it, but her lips touched it before she was quicker than I was. Did you notice I switched to the word out? Because leave it means it's not yet in your mouth, which is typically your bunny. <laughs> out means it's already in your mouth. So the moment that she actually got contact with it, I said out, and she needed to spit it out. Her first six months of her life were out, off, and leave it. That's allowed. <laughs> out, off, and leave it, because everything goes in their mouth. But she has a very strong out to where she was across the yard, and she had a baby bun in her mouth, and I said out, she'd go, and she would spit it out. Okay? So, back to proofing. Proofing is when you put your dog in various settings to know that they are proofed. So I know that if a bunny rabbit runs past Sadie, she's trained for this, she's not going to place, break position. I know if I put my food on the floor, she's not going to break position. I know if I throw food, if I squeak a toy, because I've actually trained her to all of those things. Now one time, Steele was working in a park and a horse walked by. He broke position. <laughs> He's never been proof for a horse. I wasn't expecting a horse. But, you know, so you, that's a perfect example of proofing, though. You have to try to train to a variety of situations because you never know what you're going to encounter. But the odds are you're not going to be running into a whole lot of horses. Okay? But that's a perfect example. No matter how trained they are, he struggled with a horse. Where are you going? Gotcha. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. Down. Down. So because she tends to be more enthusiastic, and as the bunny was wiggling and squirming and getting aroused, I put her into a down. Because I didn't even want her to stand up. I didn't even want her to think about wiggling. I didn't even want her to get excited. So did you notice how I capped it right away, even though the bunny was moving, I immediately just told her down, and she needed to maintain a calm position. Down. Down. She's more worried about her kibble. <laughs> down. <laughs> Okay, so with the place bed command, what you're doing is you're simply sending them on the place bed. Now, I use clickers. Little stinker. <laughs> Sadie, place. 
<laughs> it is, huh? You just need to stay from the fly a little bit. Alright, we may need help here. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. 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 We tried. Good effort. Okay, so with the placement command, what are you sniffing, girl? Steal. Come. Come on, baby boy, you can do it out of boy. Good job. Place. So you're going to take your snack and you're going to lure it onto the place bed. And when their last pop, good boy, you could click or you can just give verbal praise. Then you're going to show them the boundaries. Place. Good boy. Place. Good boy. You're going to walk around the edges so they realize that they can move. They don't have to stay in a perfect stand. Place. Good boy, place. Now, if he were to try to get off, you're just going to catch and nudge him, okay? You notice I didn't consequence him, I didn't drag him on because he's learning something brand new. So again, if he tries to catch off, you're just going to use your body language. Stinker. <laughs> place. Place. <laughs> she doesn't have to do that much. She's my little problem solver. <laughs> that's her speed command. So when you were moving your hands around earlier, Darren, she was doing it, that's her speed command. Okay, so if you have multiple dogs, place. Good job, place. And then you slowly move back. You say place, take a step, praise, and come forward. Place, walk back and come forward. You can just do that over and over so you keep getting wider and wider and wider. Hush. Okay? Then when it's time for them to get off, free! Something playful and fun with the free work. Now you notice I don't say free, okay, come on, let's go. Well, what's the command? Free, okay, come on, or let's go. And this is just simply free. Okay? So dogs are extremely cute to body language. If you teach your dog, come, there, and then I say to you, okay, don't bend. Come. They're going to look at you like they've never heard the command because they're waiting for this. When dogs hunt, they don't go burp, burp, go left, burp, burp, go right. They watch for a twitch of an ear. They watch for a position of a foot or a twitch of a tail. That's how they communicate is through body language. So we're asking them to come into an audio world, which is not natural for them. And so if we also add body language, we can make them too dependent on that and not actually queued up to our verbal commands. Okay? Questions on that? Okay. Steal. Now, a leave it command, that's simply a matter of like setting something up and leave it. Giving a little pull, leave it. You have a little piece of food down there, leave it. They reach down for it, leave it. And you just practice over and over and over and over again. Then you try it with water. You try it with food. You try it with their favorite bone. You try it with their favorite toy. And eventually you work your way up to eventually trying it with your bunny rabbit. Okay? Make sense? Oh, Just it off for the bunnies. Okay? <laughs> Questions on those commands? Okay. Now I've gotten the question of what do you do when you go out in the backyard and there is a cottontail. In general, your dog should have a very strong recall on them. Basically, all of the commands that I teach a dog, sit, down, come, place, leave it, off, out, those all boil down to three things. Stop what you're doing, stay where I put you, and come when I call you. That's what everything boils down to, all the 20 commands that they know. But what's so important about that is those are lifesavers, those aren't tricks. Stay where I put you could mean you get squished by a car. Come when I call you could mean you not calling off of a snake, okay? And stop what you're doing could mean you're about to run into a rope. So all of those commands are those three things which are so fundamental. So if you know that you have a baby bunny nest in your yard and you have to be taking your dog out to potty, what should they be going out to potty on? What's the very first thing you should be doing before you walk out that door? Getting them dressed on their scuba tanks. So collar, Long line, leash, if dogs do not potty well on a short six foot leash, you can have one of those big 30 foot long lines I told you about. It is not this retractable, and again, I'm sorry I didn't bring it, but just picture a giant cotton leash, almost like a big horse 
rope. It's just basically a long 30-foot rope. But you should have them on equipment at all times because the moment that they go out, they are going to go straight for that cottontail nest. Okay? The next thing is you want to have strong recalls, which is come when I call you, because inevitably you're going to get surprised. So if all of a sudden your dog runs out there and they're looking too curious about something, that is not the time to be trying out your very first leave it and your very first outs. It's too late at that moment, okay? So you should have hopefully already been practicing your outs and your leaves it, leave it with toys, with bones, with cookies, with hot dogs, with all kinds of different things so that when something's life is in danger, you already have a solid command on your dog. The next thing is, let's say, heaven forbid, they actually do have the baby bunny in their mouth. If you come at them, people's instinct is, nah, 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 nah. they start screaming, they holler, they panic, they run in. If you have an extremely submissive dog, which is kind of a very small subset, that dog is going to panic, probably pee on themselves, spit out the bunny, and cower and slink away. That's not most dogs, though. Most dogs are going to see you coming at them with aggression, and they are going to run the other way. They're either going to run the other way because you are aggressively coming to possess their treasure, their resource that they have just found. You are coming in with a lot of energy and attitude, and you are clearly going to take their treasure away from them. So they are going to be inclined to go the opposite direction. You're better off very calmly or even playful. What do you have? Come here. What do you have? What do you have? I know it seems it's going to take every ounce of willpower to be playful and, or even you're running the other direction, your dog is gonna follow you. Versus if you take off running, but instead, Sadie, 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 oh my goodness. Just simply moving in the opposite direction gets your dog to follow you. I tell folks, if your dog ever gets off leash away from you, do not chase them. Run in the opposite direction, pretending like you've just seen the biggest, fattest squirrel on the planet, and they're like, wait for me, and they are going to be hot on your tail. So, again, if a baby is in their mouth, you want to try, paper neck and all day, I'm going to play. you want to try to be playful, not come at them like you're going to steal their resource. Okay, now if you think you've got a really submissive dog and scream at them, it's going to make them spit it out. Great, all the more power to you, but most dogs are going to bolt and run. They're going to clamp down on it really hard or possibly even try to swallow it really quickly because they know you're going to take it away from them, okay? All right. Now, something's actually in their jaw and you need to get it out. A lot of people will try to simply pry the jaw apart. You're kind of hard-pressed to do that. They, they've they got tremendous, like I said, 750 pounds per square inch of bite pressure. We've got 200, okay? So if they have something in your mouth, your best bet is there's actually a gap right behind the canines where there is actually, see, come here, sit, where there is not a lot of teeth. See that gap right there? I can get in there behind without getting these molars. If I get back here, she's going to crush my finger with the molars. But there's a little bit of a gap right behind that canine and before those molars start. So if they have something that they're not releasing, your best bet is actually to come in and see how I push down on her tongue. I'm not gagging her. It's not pushing back to gag, but pushing down makes them go, get your fingers out of my mouth. So again, instead of trying to pry that jaw open, your best to come in, go in from the side, and push down on the tongue, just like that, okay? So whether you're trying to get a dog to release your own flesh, your arm, a bunny, a child, you know, whatever they've got, that's your best, way, best bet to get a dog to open. The other thing is if you actually have to grab a dog, if they are really about to kill something, if you're simply holding them and pulling back, you're creating that bar fight push-pull thing. The very first thing you want to do is get control of your dog so they can't run. So before you go to grab the mouth, you have to secure the body. Then go and grab the mouth. Because if you're doing this, they're going to duck and run and take off, and now you're in trouble. You're never going to catch them before the bunny's dead. So secure the dog first and foremost. Then get the mouth open by pushing down on the tongue. If they actually will not release, you also could twist and create that compression sensation. 
you're not going to snap their neck, you're not going to asphyxiate them in a moment of time, but it's going to cause them to kind of be alert and panic as opposed to just pulling in. They suddenly feel a choking sensation. They're going to panic and kind of be more worried about breathing and releasing than they are going to be about what is in their dog's mouth. So if I had to grab my dogs right now, if that was the baby buddy and they were reaching for it, I would come in and twist. Okay, do not get just two fingers in there. Come in with the whole fist and twist so that I've got complete control with the slight choke on that dog. And then I'm going to come in with my dominant hand and push down and get the tongue reflex open. Okay, so again, get control first. Grab, twist, tongue in and down. And that amount of speed, you could actually get them to release something. Grab, twist, in and out. With what, about two seconds? Three seconds? Okay. Questions? So, question. Yes. So this works on, even when dogs are really psyched up and really freaking out. Or really, I mean. The level of pressure that I have to do on a calm dog to get this, mm -hmm. if it was a dog really flipping and flailing, uh -huh. it's going to require me to be probably like this uh -huh. and have a full grip and possibly even be lifting up on that dog mm -hmm. to get the pressure. I would typically lift the dog slightly up by the neck so that the front legs are off because that weakens their stance. Mm -hmm. If you keep all four feet on the ground, they're stronger. Mm -hmm. But if she were in a fight with somebody right now, she uh -huh. were attacking an animal, I would come in under and I'm going to help her chest, so pretend I wasn't on her chest. I would have both hands here on either side and I would lift straight up. So pretend this hand's not here, I would get her up where she has less strength that way. Okay. How do you open their mouth though if you're doing that? Well, your first thing is to get them off the target. Yeah, I mean, this is with the assumption that it's not yet in their mouth. If you're just trying to get them off of it, get them away. Now, if as you lift them up, they've got that bunny in their mouth, at that point, you can get them on the ground, continue to choke, and then come in here. And do. <laughs> What did I do? What other questions do y'all have for me? What things did we not cover that you would like me to cover that have to do with dogs, rabbits, rats, cats, cottontails? We were encountered, one of our rabbits is a bit more aggressive uh -huh. and territorial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would that kind of play out? That's a good question. There's actually, I think now you mentioned it, I did skip over it. When you're introducing your rabbit to your dog, if your rabbit asserts themselves against the dog, what I tell them is let them do that. Let the rabbit, the rabbit smacks them, the cat smacks them upside the head, let it happen. Because my message to my dogs, Sadie's been laying on the ground before and my rats are running around and Tilly's a little rat and she likes to nibble on Sadie's legs. And I'll see Sadie there and all of a sudden she's like, ma, ma, ma. But the message to her is I don't care, it's much smaller. Be nice. You're... I will come over, I will remove Tilly. I'm not gonna make you sit there and get nibbled by Tilly. But the point is, she never ever has permission to react to Tilly, even if Tilly bit her, I don't care, she's smaller, okay? So, and again, that kind of comes from that hierarchy. Now, with regards to um, a more aggressive rabbit, if you find that the rabbit aggresses towards the dog and the dog aggresses back, that's where you need to address the dog. Don't feel like, well, the rabbit started it, because again, that goes back to you're the littler creature, you have more leeway. Then you want to kind of go with soothing the rabbit. So what if you know the rabbit tends to be aggressive towards the dog, that's where instead of when we were doing this exercise here, work on getting the rabbit calm. Have, you know, smooshed banana on your finger. And so if the rabbit is not so freaked out every time the dog is near. So the rabbit now makes the reverse association. When that big dog is around, I don't have to be aggressive and smacking and snarling. I can lay there and suck on a banana finger instead and be much calmer. So it's the reverse of that. Teach the rabbit to be at ease when the dog is around. Okay? What else? You look like you have a question. I see the hamster wheels turning. Well, I want to say something that's not what? a question. Go ahead. It's basically kudos to Shannon. Uh, Joey, our very colleague, who's now eight, when he was a puppy, he just didn't want to come very much, you know, <laughs> and I uh, kind of had a version of that. Shannon came over, and that 30-foot long, it's red, yep. that 30-foot long leash, she was showing us how to use that. Well, because of what she showed us, uh, it got to a point where 
we would get the leash in hand and have it about, you know, looked up about this far apart. I gotta stand up to do this. <laughs> We'd have it about this far apart than Joey, and he would go to the far fence, you know, back there. He would just come up like that and, and go up, say, come. And then you'd get up there and he would kind of get back and you just, he'd kind of feel cornered and you would go and you'd just drop the leash on him. He's like, oh crap. You know, like that really, you're like, that is a good boy. Get him in and walk in and bring him in, right? Well, but we didn't have to hook the leash on it. Well, now, I don't know, it's almost like, I don't know if you want to call it the pose or whatever, but you walk out in the backyard, he's there, jump, like that, and I do this, like that, and he doesn't, no kidding, it's just like this, just walk out real calmly and go like this with my hands. And, <laughs> and he does it. Yeah. But it all started. It was, well, and he's gotten thing. trained to your, this has become your hand signal. Yeah. Okay, now it's funny, if I do this to Sadie, I do this with her all the time, I sneak up and I go. <laughs> <laughs> if I start to do this with her, she'll get all. Because <laughs> she knows. And so she's cute up to that game. So they are extremely cute to your body language. And so it can work to your favor. It can also work to your disadvantage. Um, and like in Joey's case, what you guys can even do is take a step further. If he's really strong with his downs, Joey, down. He's way over there, he's in a down. Good boy, down. If you've got good aim, you can even chuck a snap. Good boy, down. Good boy, down. You're rewarding him for the down as you get a closer and closer as you approach. I had a client whose dog was terrible at the recalls, took off running, running aimlessly through a parking lot. She goes, Roxy, down. And Roxy hit the pavement because she stunk at her recalls, but she was really strong at her downs. And she was able to walk up and put the dog's leash on and get control of her. So, what else? You guys have been a wonderful audience. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yes. um, if you ever have any questions, all of my contact information is on the last page. There is a soft copy of this document. So for anyone who missed it or they want to forward it to a friend or anything like that, I think you guys are going to, I'm going to give you a soft copy. But I think you also will put it up on the website or something so you guys can have access to it. And then, um, like I said, I can't emphasize enough, you know, been doing this for 11 years. I specialize in prey drive. I don't want you guys just going home and feeling like you can whip out the bunny and the pit bull and put them together. <laughs> you know? just, you, you've got to do this supervised, trained, etc. Oh, I sure did. I made a mistake. Okay. If you look at the very last page, the phone number, the very first digit is 653. Looks like the six accidentally got deleted. <laughs> Thank you so much for catching up. Can I ask a possible question? Yes, please. Can you train the rabbit? To do what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my rabbits will come when I call them. I've trained my cat. My cat knows the word off. My cat knows the hop up command. Um, she knows to get off sofa when she hears a command. She knows the word out. So if she's chewing on me and I say out, she can spit it out. My rats come when they are called. So my rats have, are trained. You can train any creature. And like with the clicker conditioning, what I tell folks, if you've ever been to SeaWorld and you've seen the killer whale do his flip, if you've ever noticed what the trainer does when the killer whale lands, if you watch the trainer closely, they have a little whale tail hanging on their chest. So they will blow the little whale tail, or you'll see them pat the water. That signals because they feel the vibrations to come over there and get their fish. But the second that killer whale lands, they go, nice flip, killer whale, come get your fish. So they are marking the 1.5 second association that I talked about earlier. So either you're teaching a dog to down, or you're teaching a dog to high five, or sneeze, or bang, or whatever you're doing, it's all about capturing that 1.5 second association between the action, the cause, and the effect. So you can train anything, big, small. Um, I've seen people even train their fish to do like circles at the top before they feed them. You can train anything with repetition and consistency. The three key, key things to train any creature are timing, consistency, and motivation. Those of you that are parents, Am I addressing the child in a timely manner? Am I being consistent with what I'm expecting of the child? And am I motivating them properly, whether it be positive motivation or consequence motivation? That's what it boils down to, whether you're training a human, a dog, a cat, or a rabbit, or a killer whale. It's all the same thing. Yes? Are there any particular commands you would recommend for rabbits? I mean, one knows Tom, she knows her name. Mm -hmm. She knows carrots. She knows her rabbits to do all yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so the same things I would think with the dog, like if you want it to project up through a hula hoop or you want it to project up onto a table, I would say hop up because I would not have separate commands for those two different things because if you think about the simplistic action of the rabbit or the dog, 
whether they're hopping up on the sofa or they're hopping up in the back of my SUV. It requires the same action, which is this, okay? And so a lot of people have hop up, hop in the car, hop down. They've got 80 different commands. Your dog does not need it. Hop up means project yourself up. Project yourself through the hoop, project yourself out of the sofa. But yes, you can teach a spin. You usually want to use one or two word commands. And typically you want to lure the creature. Like if you're starting to teach something to spin, like with Sadie, when she learned her bang, it's called chaining. You want to break, still used to know CPR. When I took my certification course all those years ago, still knew CPR. He, we started with teaching him a kiss command. So it was, give me a kiss. Nah, give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Oh, good boy. So he started with a kiss command. Then I taught him like a mark command. So he would hit my chest, kiss, hit my chest, kiss, hit my chest, kiss. So you're chaining sequences together. When she learned her bang, sit, bang, <laughs> bang. <laughs> you start with her sitting and throwing herself down. And then her key, she took it one more step and she would start rolling. So I had to stop that. But you want to break any command that you teach her. Hush, hush, sit, hush. High five. Good girl. Thanks. Good girl. You want to break anything down into any simple common denominator. But this is another great way to teach leave it. Down. Leave it. Leave it. Down. Leave it. She hasn't done this one in a while. Uh, uh, uh. Down. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. So if you can leave those two things on your paws, leave it. You're going to be in pretty good shape when it comes time to leaving Tilly alone or leaving the bunny alone. Leave it. Now, I never just simply say F-R-E-E and let her take them off the paws. So if I ever drop food, it always comes from my hand. So if pretend, like if I want to reward her right now, I take it off the paw and I hand it to her. Leave it. Because you don't have permission to just simply grab it and snatch it right now. Out. Leave it. <laughs> Leave it. Good girl. So if I drop something on the floor right now and I'm like, oh, crap, leave it. It's just a hot dog. I'm going to let her have it. I don't let her just grab it because then one day it's a pill. It's a vitamin. It's something else. So anything, leave it. Leave it. If I decide I want her to have it, I'm going to pick it up and hand it to her. I don't let them just suck it up off the floor because it's a very slippery slope between them just grabbing it and them having permission to have it. Okay, but that's another way you can practice your leave outs. Okay, what else? Thank you. Thank you.